Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Claudine Chevrier from the National Collaborative Center for Infectious Diseases, at, or NCCID. Uh, welcome to the Public Health Agency of Canada's webinar for healthcare providers on today's topic, Seasonal Influenza 2023-2024, or collabor in collaboration with the NCCID. The NCCID is funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada to provide knowledge and evidence uh, for use in public health planning and policy and is supporting the agency with knowledge translation. I'd like to acknowledge that NCCID is located at the University of Manitoba on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. Um, so I'm going to introduce my, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'd like to introduce and welcome our speakers for today's webinar, since I've already introduced myself, uh, Dr. Robin Harrison and Dr. Jesse Pappenberg. Uh, Dr. Harrison is the Vice Chair of the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, or NACI. She is an infectious disease specialist and as a clinical professor at the University of Alberta in the Department of Medicine, Division of Infectious Diseases. She joins us today from Edmonton, Alberta. Dr. Pappenberg is the chair of the Influenza Working Group at NACI. He is an assistant professor of pediatrics and an associate member of the Department of Epidemiology, Biostatistics, and Occupational Health at McGill University. He practices pediatric infectious diseases and medical microbiology at the Montreal Children's Hospital of the McGill, McGill University Health Center. He joins us today from Montreal, Quebec. So here are the disclosures for today's presentation. Myself and Dr. Harrison have no conflict of interest to disclose. Dr. Jesse Pappenberg discloses the following. Research grants from MedImmune, grants and personal fees from Merck, personal fees from AstraZeneca. And here are the learning objectives for today's presentation. At the end of this webinar, participants will be able to discuss the importance of seasonal influenza vaccination with people in Canada, identify and address barriers to seasonal influenza vaccine uptake, apply the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, or NACI, recommendations on seasonal influenza vaccine use for the 2023-2024 season, identify where to access NACI guidance, Canadian Influenza Antiviral Guidelines, and other resources relevant to prevention and treatment of influenza during the 2023-2024 season. I would now like to turn the floor over to Dr. Harrison, who will be our first speaker. Over to you, Dr. Harrison. Okay, thank you, Claudine, and thank you to the NCCID, our host today, and to the Public Health Agency of Canada team members who are help uh, bringing this uh, to you all today and to us. And uh, thank you to all those who have signed in. So the first uh, thing we're going to do is just set the stage. We're going to remind everybody here, and maybe for some of you will learn for the first time, what really is the burden of influenza and which populations are at highest risk? This is our first topic. Next slide, please. What I'm going to do is just focus on the period um, of, with the influenza before the COVID-19 pandemic. This is where we have uh, years of data that don't have the interference from the SARS-CoV-2 SARS virus and all that came with the COVID-19 pandemic. And what we saw when you look at those years and with influenza, you really do have to look year after year and look at the uh, sum of um, <clears throat> evidence as a whole because there is variation year to year. But what we saw was that uh, minimizing influenza-related morbidity and mortality reduces burden on the healthcare system and improves the health of people and saves lives. So just to put some numbers behind this, globally, every year, worldwide, seasonal influenza is estimated to cause a billion infections every year. Three to five million of those will be severe illness, and that will result in almost 300,000 to more than half a million deaths. Historically, the global annual attack rate was estimated to be about 5 to 10% in adults and 20 to 30% in children. When we focus in on Canada, we see that influenza and pneumonia are ranked among the top 10 leading causes of death in Canada. And every year, it's estimated that influenza causes approximately 3,500 deaths of Canadians and 12,200 hospital stays. So this is a major challenge we face 
um, year after year. And as I said, this these were the years prior to the pandemic. Next slide, please. Now, as we're looking at the last three years, um, speaking about the COVID-19 pandemic, what we saw start to emerge last year was a return towards that pre-pandemic-like pattern. So uh, as many of you will know, the influenza burden was actually at historical, unprecedented lows during the first two years that we had the SARS-CoV-2 virus circulating. But in 2022 to 2023, we saw a very brisk, and a uh, rather dramatic return of influenza virus and particularly H3N2, and we're gonna talk about that. Um, so on this graph, which you see here reported are the percentage of tests that were positive in Canada compared to previous seasons. And if you follow the blue curve, you see that really dramatic uptick in cases that came very early, a little earlier than the dashed line, which would be your average from, uh, you can see the numbers, the years written there, 2014 to say 2019-20 uh, season, just before the COVID pandemic. So what you see is it, it um, we had a really dramatic increase in cases and that was felt across the health system, of course, and for all of those who were ill with influenza. 2023 to 24, 24 current season, there is a possibility of simultaneous outbreaks, just like we saw last year with influenza, respiratory syncytial virus, and SARS-CoV-2, a COVID-19 illness. So this is what, of course, we're preparing for and why we're talking about this today. Next slide, please. So 2022 to 2023, really started uh, October 2022 relatively early, as I've just mentioned, and H3N2 was a predominant strain um, that, that had impact. Uh, interestingly, perhaps for children in particular last season, but we also know H3N2 uh, is a, uh, tends to cause a severe form of influenza, and we see that particularly in elderly patients when we look year after year. So it's a very serious disease, and, um, and we certainly saw that last year. There was a very high proportion of detections occurring in those age zero to 19 last year, 42%. And provinces and territories reported higher than usual influenza associated hospitalizations, intensive care unit admissions and deaths in comparison with previous seasons. So as I mentioned, in particular, pediatric hospitalization was persistently far above historical peaks and it lasted for several weeks. Influenza vaccine coverage last year returned to pre-pandemic levels of about 43%, remembering that our Canadian goal has been set at 80%. So uh, unfortunately, it would have been a very good year to have increased that number, but we were uh, at about a pre-pandemic level. And the year before, 2021 to 2022, it was even lower at 39%. So we have some work to do in uh, working to prevent influenza through immunization. There was no significant improvement in recent years in the vaccine coverage goal, as I mentioned, and um, we continue to strive to meet that goal. Next slide. I suspect uh, many on this call, if not all, know the typical symptoms of influenza, but it's always worth just reflecting on these for a moment, especially if we're talking about multiple respiratory viruses circulating together. The hallmark has long been sudden onset of cough, fever, muscle aches and pains, and often fatigue, loss of appetite, sore throat, runny or stuffy nose. In children, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea may occur, and you can also have atypical presentation in the elderly, and you may not see the fever that's thought to be so typical with influenza in, in most people. So these symptoms, as you can see, overlap with other respiratory viruses. Um, um, and another key point that some... Uh, uh, may not realize is just how much an influenza illness that the infection can worsen underlying chronic medical conditions. And we're talking about things like heart attacks, strokes, other things can manifest when a person is ill with influenza. So that's another reason that it is a serious disease. Most people fortunately recover in seven to 10 days, but those at increased risk, and sometimes that's hard to predict, uh, can go on to have severe complications, hospitalization, or even death. Next slide, please. So 
I've alluded to this on the last slide, but I wanted to point out this publication that uh, has created a very interesting figure we thought we would share with you, just highlighting how these respiratory viruses and their symptoms can really overlap. So this circle image here, is showing you uh, the very uh, different symptoms like sore throat, cough, runny nose, sneezing, fever that are typical with actually most of the respiratory and viruses that infect humans. Fever is a little more common with some than others. So if you look at the blue ring, that's influenza and you see fevers out there at the 80% mark, 80% of people having fever. And if you look at SARS-CoV-2 causing COVID-19, you're actually looking at the inner red ring. So you'll note that difference in fever. You'll see that headache is common with both influenza and SARS-CoV-2, but you also see RSV and uh, rhinovirus, other common viruses. So it's very difficult when you're using symptoms alone to differentiate uh, which virus a person is ill with. And I think that's important to keep in mind, especially when we're thinking about the things we can do to prevent spread of these illnesses. Um, so this overlapping uh, symptomatology really highlights some of the things we're talking about today, seeking, testing, staying home when ill, use of antiviral uh, uh, medications when it's relevant, but primary prevention through immunization for, it, for the viruses where we can do that and, and be successful. Um, next slide, please. So... Um, of the influenza viruses, the two uh, types that we see infecting humans most often are influenza A and B. They're the types that cause seasonal outbreaks in humans. We call we refer to these as seasonal influenza viruses, and they're really classified in subtypes based on their two surface proteins, the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase. Influenza A that have caused widespread disease over the decades, as we just talked about, are, are really um, divided into three subtypes of uh, hemagglutinin, H1, H2, H3, and two subtypes of the neuraminidase, N1 and N2. With influenza B viral strains, we have two lineages, B Yamagata, B Victoria. So, one of the reasons you see uh, repeated immunization or differences in the outbreaks year to year is that antigenic variation, and we refer to it as antigenic drift with influenza, occurs um, in both influenza A or B lineages. Every now and then, you can also see antigenic shift, a more dramatic change due to reassortment of genes. And when that happens, you tend to have an abrupt change, typically in the influenza A viruses. And of course, this is um, why we have risk of pandemics and so on. Next slide, please. So it's this uh, evolution in the virus that is one of the reasons seasonal influenza vaccines are developed uh, with new strain coverage year over year. It's in response to that. So there's this ever possib present possibility of drift or even shift, that means they're reformulated annually. And the way this is done is it's based on global surveillance and observations. The World Health Organization establishes which components should be included in the vaccine for the upcoming season. They, um, in the Northern or Southern hemispheres, of course, the Southern hemisphere will have uh, their outbreaks happening first. And so uh, this information is all factored in. Influenza vaccines are based on the best predictions for the upcoming season. And, as such, the efficacy can vary year to year. When the vaccine prediction is spot on, you can expect you should have better efficacy and effectiveness of your vaccine because you have a good match. That's the way it's sometimes referred to. Several influenza strains can be included in a vaccine, which is uh, fortunate. Uh, historically, we had trivalent vaccines, including three stains. Now what you'll see, the vaccines that are being supplied um, in Canada are quadrivalent, so you can have four uh, strains in one vaccine dose, two influenza A strains, and two B. A circulating influenza strain within a population can sometimes change during the flu season, and so that may also affect the uh, effect efficacy and the effectiveness that you'll see during a given season. Health and age of a person at the individual level can also affect how well the vaccine works for that given person. So we know, for example, those who are young and healthy um, may uh, typically have a better uh, immune response to the immunization than those whose immune systems 
uh, may be uh, impaired or or in amongst the elderly where they have immunosenescence and may not respond as well, um, in, in part related to age. Vaccine-induced immunity also can wane over time. So there's another reason that you see uh, repeated immunization. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, the World Health Organization chooses the composition. So this slide is really just for your reference. These are the strains that will be this year. And as I mentioned, uh, it's 2A, 2B, and in the quadrivalent vaccines that we have, and you are still seeing the pandemic 2009-like virus as one of the um, A strains. And of course, there's always an H3 and 2 included in the vaccines. Next slide, please. We just, uh, I think, spoke to this influenza vaccine effectiveness, which can vary um, year over year for a number of factors. It includes the match of the strain. It includes um, uh, the characteristics of the outbreak. We are very fortunate in Canada to have the surveillance network looking at this, and you can, uh, you'll see these reports were public published each year and watch for these. Um, you'll, you should expect something. Usually, there's an interim report around January, I believe. So, people who've received the flu vaccine and still contract flu um, are less likely to suffer serious flu-related complications or require hospitalizations. Testing, as you know, uh, not everyone gets tested for influenza, but certainly um, uh, at the, uh, those being admitted to hospital, presenting to hospital, testing is an important part of differentiating all of these viruses. And it's where we can uh, learn from these data. The testing's very helpful when we know uh, who's been infected and who's been immunized. The body's immune response to influenza vaccination is transient, may not persist beyond a year. And as I said, that's why we recommend it year to year. But what we wanted to show you here, when you look at all these seasons, you see the variability, but you also see around the 50% mark, 40 to 60%, uh, is where you see effectiveness falling. And again, that depends in part on the host. For some people, you're much closer to, you know, some populations rather, you're much closer to that 60% year after year. Next slide, please. Now, we said there is a Canadian goal to have 80% who are those who of those who are at higher risk of complications vaccinated. We really do have a long way to go to meet that, unfortunately. And that's one of the reasons we're meeting and talking about this. Um, we, we need to raise awareness about the benefit of immunization, the severity of influenza, and, and how this uh, simple step that we can take together protects. What you see in Canada is that the seniors, those who are 65 years and older, have much higher uptake than other age group, even those in the 18 to 64 who have chronic medical conditions that put them at significant uh, risk for severe influenza complications. Um, and so we wanted to sort of highlight this for you, that we still have room to move across all of the age groups. And these are, again, this target is for those even at highest risk of complications for influenza. This is, um, you do see all adults on the far left, but uh, on the right of the slide is those at highest risk. Next slide, please. So one of the groups that is at increased risk of a severe illness with flu with influenza are those people who are pregnant. So we wanted to share a little bit of information about a recent survey on vaccination during pregnancy. This was done through the pandemic, you can see in 2021. 53% of pregnant individuals were vaccinated against influenza that year, which was higher than the national average I mentioned at the top of this uh, talk, but, but still not quite meeting or not near target. It was up from 45%. We have some reason to be hopeful. The uh, impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on vaccination during pregnancy was explored, and 77% of women reported that there was no impact of the pandemic on their decision vac to vaccinate, uh, but 17% reported that they were more inclined to vaccinate, and I think that's also a helpful bit of, um, bit of information. Only 6% were less inclined to vac get vaccination for protection from influenza during the pandemic. Next slide, please. Women who had received a recommendation to be vaccinated from their primary health care provider during pregnancy were more likely to receive vaccination against pertussis and influenza compared to those who did not. And I can't emphasize this enough. 
for all of those on the call who are healthcare workers, and I expect that that's many of you, do not underestimate uh, the impact of, of the support you provide to people in their um, contemplating immunization. And that includes in your community um, and outside of work too. But, but certainly when you have a patient or, or a person in front of you thinking about immunization, um, healthcare workers are still viewed as a, the, a person with uh, trustworthy information that they can depend upon. And if the recommendation comes from them, um, uh, they're more likely to be immunized and therefore better protected. Next slide, please. So uh, one of the things we wanted to mention to you forthcoming this fall is a new supplemental statement on influenza immunization during pregnancy from the National Advisory Committee on Immunization. So what the National Advisory Committee did was completed a very comprehensive review of evidence from clinical trials, real world, world data on safety, efficacy, and effectiveness of influenza vaccination in pregnancy. Um, and it uh, included exploring the benefits and risks to developing fetus and infants under six months of age and pregnant women. Um, there have been a number of publications in recent years. And so this is a really nice opportunity to summarize that information. And it will be a useful tool, uh, I think, to those of you who are counseling uh, people who are pregnant, because all of this is summarized and, um, and it is supportive of immunization. So it isn't a change in recommendation. This was, of course, already uh, recommended by, um, by NASI, but it is um, adding and summarizing the newer body of evidence on this topic. So the conclusion of this most recent was, review was that evidence supports the safety and effectiveness of influenza vaccination during pregnancy. It reduces the risk of influenza, has no identified link to negative outcomes in pregnant individuals and their infants. So again, these are things that can help uh, pregnant people feel confident in, in choosing their immunization for influenza every year that they're pregnant. Um, and uh, following the review, uh, as I said, the recommendations haven't changed, but you'll be able to read the details in the statement uh, when it's published later this fall. So watch for that. Next slide, please. The key takeaways from this section on influenza and the burden of influenza and, and um, this sort of overview of, of, um, of influenza vaccines is that it Influenza itself can lead to severe complications, including hospitalization and death. Most people recover in seven to 10 days, but some do not. For best possible protection, it is recommended to get the influenza vaccine annually. And I hope we've tried to show you a few of the reasons why that is. And um, uh, important to remember that this is indeed something that's recommended every season, given that the vaccine may not persist beyond a year and also that there are change in what's circulating. Next slide, please. So one final reminder we have, it would seem based on last season returned to pre-pandemic like influenza trends. And so although influenza can be, uh, it's famous for being unpredictable, that is what we would estimate for this season. So this is a very good year to continue to be immunized or to begin if you haven't been immunized yourself and to encourage others to do the same. And the potential co-circulation again of influenza, SARS-CoV-2 and other respiratory viruses raise concern for our high risk populations and our health system capacity, um, especially in this time when we are just uh, working our way through with the SARS CoV-2 virus, which is still new to us. So a healthcare provider recommendation to be immunized against influenza will increase the likelihood others are immunized and, um, and that we think that's very important for you to know. Claudine, I'll hand it to you here for a moment. Thank you so much. So we can switch to the next slide. We've arrived at our first interactive poll of the presentation, and we are starting with a true or false question. So for those of you uh, who are on Zoom, you should see the question pop up on your screen. Uh, all polling answers are anonymous, so you can just go ahead and choose it. If you are joining us from YouTube, uh, you won't be able to participate in the poll, although of course you can still answer for yourself. So you can just go ahead and answer the question. The question is, uh, those 18 to 65 years of age with chronic medical conditions are closer to the 80% influenza vaccination goal rate than those 65 years of age and older. True or false? So 
So we're giving you a bit more time to answer. And we should see the answer now. The correct answer was false. Currently, those aged 65 years and older are closer to the 80% influence of vaccination goal rate than those 18 to 65 years of age with chronic medical conditions. So 74% and 43% respectively. So continue to encourage vaccination for this demographic. A lot of you got the correct answer. Thank you. And so we will move on to the next section. So we can, uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so we are back for this section with Dr. Harrison. So over to you, Dr. Harrison, thank you. Thank you. So this is my uh, second section, and this will be a relatively short one compared to the first, and then Dr. Pappenberg is going to take over. So healthcare provider role in vaccine uptake. That's our next topic. We've, we've touched on it. We've alluded to it. It's important. But how do we build confidence, enable access, and identify and address barriers in a way that are going to be most helpful to uh, those around us? Next slide, please. Conversations about seasonal influenza vaccine may look a little different going forward further to the COVID-19 pandemic. And for anyone who joined us for this webinar last year, we did talk a bit about this. It has been uh, incredible to see the number of people who've been really engaged on the topic of immunization. This is thanks to, this is something, we, some good that I think has come from the COVID-19 pandemic in that we have people wanting to learn more about how they can protect themselves through immunization. And they really wanted to know details more than ever before. So for those of you providing influenza immunization, you should be aware of this. You may want to know what kind of vaccine you're providing in that clinic on that date if you're actually an immunization provider. People may ask you, what brand is it? How does it work? Is it an mRNA vaccine? No, it's not. What kind of vaccine is it? How effective is it? So that's um, these are things you probably want to have in your back pocket or on notes if you need them, just so that you're ready to answer those to the person in front of you. It can help them feel confident and help them um, uh, have a better understanding of how vaccines work. So try to use plain language, of course, try to do it in a culturally sensitive manner and an age appropriate manner. So really take the moment to engage with a person right in front of you, what is going to be most helpful for them? And how can I say this in a way that they're going to feel confident and, and not feel overwhelmed? Um, provide information on the severe impacts of disease. Um, it's, it's important because some people don't realize the seriousness of the disease. And when they're weighing um, sort of the pros and cons of choosing to be immunized, they need to have that forefront to remember why they're even contemplating vaccine in the first place. We wouldn't do it if we didn't have a illness with severity that we could prevent. Be prepared to discuss potential risk factors from the vaccine and talk about whether they can receive this vaccine with uh, safely with other vaccines. And most often the answer to that is yes. Be prepared to discuss and explain why alternative practices don't replace vaccines. Again, this, this is one of our, this is our best example of primary prevention. And so it's really important to be clear about that. Um, next slide, please. Now, this, these five C's, this five C model, if you will, of vaccine hesitancy is presented to you in a, a guide called the Primer for Healthcare Providers that the Public Health Agency of Canada has put together. I have found these five C's helpful in my practice, um, and I hope some of you have too. What I, what I like is that it helps me remember these five words, confidence, complacency, convenience, calculation, collective responsibility. I find thinking about these five different themes helps me uh, to hear what someone is saying to me when they're expressing that they're hesitant or they explain why they didn't become immunized one season or why they're thinking they won't this season. It helps me to organize the information in my own mind so I can really listen to them. So you want to active and engage listening, hear what they're saying, and then you have a little better idea, I feel, in what you can give them in return to help address the concerns they have. Because I think it's important to remember, you have some people who are very in favor of vaccines, you have a very small minority who are not at all, and you have probably many in the middle who may have some hesitancy, some really good questions, and they need to make their decision. And so this is a way you can help organize what they're saying to you to help deliver something that's helpful to them. Next slide, please. 
This year, we wanted to introduce another model. This is a position paper published by the World Health Organization. And this, this um, organizes behavioral and social drivers of vaccination in the framework. And it summarized key factors that influence uptake. And so um, I wanna just take a minute to comment on this. If you read through the colored boxes here, you can see thinking and feeling. This is, these are the thoughts people have about perceived disease risk, vaccine confidence, it also speaks to social processes that will feed into this. So do you have support from your family? What about your religious leaders, your elders? What about if you're a healthcare worker? What is the recommendation in your hospital or organization, your community of workers in your specialty or field and gender equity? So intention uh, to become vaccinated is uh, umbrella under motivation and the factors that feed into that. And then there are practical issues that, and again, these are things we can modify. So the practical issues are availability, affordability, how easy is access to this vaccine? And remember that some people living in a lower socioeconomic status or remote areas have not had easy access to vaccine. This is a barrier that we have to see to address it and to improve, and especially for those at highest risk of diseases like influenza when we're providing this vaccine. Um, and this, of course, all feeds into uptake of our recommended vaccines. So these are things we can strategically work our way through to improve um, uh, the delivery and, and the uptake of vaccine. Next slide, please. Finally, just want to summarize the factors that are preventing people um, from being vaccinated. Is, um, you know, whether whatever model you're using, it's your chance to connect with someone and leave a door open for these discussions, even if they don't make a decision the first time you speak with them. So the advice is to be transparent about risks of the illness, risks and benefits of vaccination. Cultivate a safe space to have these discussions. That means for some people, that may mean just taking a quiet corner alone, not in front of a whole family or whatever the situation is. Make sure you're really actively listening to the needs of the person right in front of you and activate the right emotions. So you really want to, um, for example, speak to the community. This obtaining vaccine is something that we do together in healthcare. As a healthcare worker at my hospital, this is something I enjoy doing with others because it's a way I know I can work to protect others and myself and my family. Tap into that rather than, than making someone feel ashamed or sad or guilty that they didn't do it last year. It doesn't really matter this season. Now is your chance to, uh, to take this step together. And try, of course, to avoid judgment and labels. Next slide, please. So the takeaway are discuss the importance of the vaccine with your patients, your community members, your friends, family, clients, um, especially if they're at increased risk of influenza complications themselves. And that's anyone living with a, a, a comorbid disease at the extremes of ages, very young, very old, pregnant people. Um, discuss the importance if you're capable of transmitting to those at high risk. That's people like me. I work with patients. They're vulnerable people to, and, and uh, I work in a hospital setting. I need the workforce there. I need my colleagues there. We're, we need to be well at work and many industries have that. You don't have to be in healthcare to have that need. You need to stay home when sick and be present and well and not sick. And that's why we use vaccine. Um, definitely um, seek to understand the factors that are preventing an individual from getting vaccine. Find ways to help by being respectful, culturally sensitive, age appropriate, and, and just remember everyone has really different needs on this particular topic. And then of course we've offered this framework from the WHO to start to systematically address barriers within your organizations. Next slide please. This is the next question. I'll hand it to you and sign off here, Claudine, for Dr. Pappenberg. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Harrison. So that brings us to our second interactive poll, which is a multiple choice. Uh, so the question is, within the World Health Organization's, um, sorry, my apologies, within the World Health Organization behavioral and social drivers of vaccination framework, social norms and health workers' recommendations are part of which key factor? Is it A, thinking and feeling, B, social processes, C, motivation, or D, practical issues? So you can go ahead and answer directly on the screen if you are joining us on Zoom. Uh, again, that is not accessible for people on YouTube, but you can, of course, answer for yourself. Giving you a minute to answer.
I think we should get the results right away. So the correct answer was B, social processes, as uh, uh, many of you have chosen. So social process interventions can include community engagement, positive social norm messages, vaccine champions and advocates, and recommendations to be vaccinated from healthcare workers. Thank you. So I would now like to turn the floor over to Dr. Pappenberg, who will cover the NACI recommendations. Over to you, Dr. Pappenberg. Hi, everybody. Thanks for, thanks for having me and thanks for attending. Uh, next slide, please. I was clicking to advance. Uh, so what is NACI, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization? It's an expert advisory body that provides independent advice to the Public Health Agency of Canada on the op optimal use of vaccines in Canada. So NACI makes recommendations for the vaccination of individuals and also makes recommendations for vaccine programs. So you can think of, you know, the individual aspect, what is what do we think is the best choice for this for a person or this type of person or this pot, part of the population, as well as programmatic considerations and, you know, what kind of advice can we offer provinces with regards to the implementation of their programs. But ultimately, provinces and territories are are responsible for their vaccine policies and their immunization programs. Now, it's important to note that NACI recommendations may be broader or narrower than the conditions of use approved by Health Canada. And that's because NACI will look at a broader scope of evidence than uh, Health Canada looks at. Health Canada looks at the efficacy and safety of a product, whereas NACI will obviously take, you know, those elements will be very important for rec at NACI recommendations. But NACI can also look at what other products are available in the for the Canadian population, what's the epidemiology of the disease in Canada, um, and uh, other uh, considerations such as ethics, equity, feasibility, acceptability, as well as health economics. So every year, NACI issues a statement on seasonal influenza vaccine. It informs healthcare providers on the optimal use of vaccines available for influenza in Canada based on the most up-to-date information available. And you can find the 23-24 statement online, as well as a plain language summary. Next slide. The Canadian Immunization Guide chapter on influenza vaccine summar summarizes all the key clinical information on seasonal influenza vaccine administration for vaccine providers. And this year, as part of a modernization process to improve the readability and access to information, NACI influ the NACI flu statement is now separate from the CIG chapter on influenza. Next slide, please. So who should receive the flu vaccine? Well, NACI recommends that all people six months of age and older who do not have contraindications to the vaccine receive influenza vaccination. But in particular, uh, we would like to prioritize people at high risk of influenza related complications or hospitalization, people capable of transmitting influenza to those at high risk, as well as, as, well as others at higher risk of exposure. Next slide. So we define persons at high risk of influenza related complication or hospitalization as certain groups at high risk, such as children under the age of five, in particular those under the age of two, so six months of age to 59 months of age, all persons who are pregnant, people of any age who are residents of nursing care homes and other chronic care facilities, the elderly, so adults 65 years of age and above, as well as Indigenous persons. Adults and children with high-risk chronic health conditions are also prioritized. Cardiac or pulmonary disorders, diabetes mellitus and other metabolic diseases, cancer, immune compromising conditions, renal disease, anemia or hemoglobinopathy, neurologic or neurodevelopmental conditions, morbid obesity, and children six months of age to 18 years of age undergoing treatment for long periods with aspirin or acetylsalicylic acid. Next slide. What about people capable of transmitting influenza to those at high risk? So we consider that healthcare workers and other providers in facilities and community settings are, uh, are fall within this group. Healthcare workers, essential care providers, emergency response workers, continuing long-term care facility workers, home care workers, students in healthcare fields, as well as regular visitors for uh, in these places. Um, and it includes any person paid or unpaid who provides services, works, volunteers, or trains in a hospital, clinic, or other healthcare facility. 
And due to their occupation and close contact with people who may be infected with influenza, these people are themselves at increased risk of spreading infection and being infected with influenza. Next slide, please. That people capable of transmitting influenza to those at high risk also include household contacts, both adults and children of uh, individual at high risk, whether the individual is high risk has been vaccinated or not. For example, household contacts of individuals at high risk, household contacts of infants less than six months of age, as these babies are at high risk for hospitalization due to influenza but cannot receive the vaccine. Members of a household expecting a newborn during the influenza season, so a kind of cocooning, if you will. Those providing regular childcare to children uh, uh, under five years of age, whether in or out of the home, and those who provide services within closed or relatively closed settings to people at high risk, for example, the crew on a ship. Next slide. And there are other people who are considered at higher risk of exposure, such as people who provide essential community services, people in direct contact with poultry in, that's potentially infected with avian influenza during culling operations. Uh, in order, and we want to prevent that, those infections, to reduce the possibility of a dual infection uh, between a human strain and an avian strain, leading to the theoretical potential for human avian reassortment of genes. Next slide. So, what's new in the 2324 statement? So we've updated some information. So the age indication for the flu cell vax, which is a cell culture based vaccine, the flu cell vax quad, uh, it now may be considered among the quadrivalent influenza vaccine offered to adults and children six months of age and older. Uh, there's also the age in indication of Influvac Tetra and NASI recommends that Influvac Tetra standard dose may be considered among the standard dose inactivated quadrivalent influenza vaccines offered to individuals three years of age and older. And NASI concluded that there is insufficient evidence for recommending vaccination with this particular product in kids under three years of age. We've also updated the types of influenza vaccines available in Canada for the 23-24 season. Next slide, please. Uh, more new or updated information? Well, uh, uh, Robin has already mentioned that there's new supplemental statement on the use of influenza vaccination during pregnancy, where uh, NASI reaffirmed its strong recommendation that influenza vaccines should be offered annually at any stage in the pregnancy to protect the pregnant person and to protect baby uh, through passive transfer of antibodies. There's also guidance on concurrent administration of influenza and COVID-19 vaccines. In other words, NASI now outlines that you can give the COVID-19 vaccine uh, at the same time or any time before or after influenza immunization. And that goes for any of the vaccines, whether they be intramuscular or intranasal uh, in all persons six months of age and older. Previously, that recommendation had been for those five, of, five years of age and older. Uh, we've also updated the standard dose trivalent inactivated vaccine authorization and availability. In other words, uh, we're, we're expecting that all vaccines in the 23-24 uh, season uh, will be quadrivalent. We've also updated the presentation of the statement, uh, modernizing the uh, chapter in the CIG, uh, completely separating it from the NACI statement. Next slide, please. Here you see the influenza vaccine schedule for seasonal influenza, and you can see that most people require only one dose. However, two doses at a four week interval are required for children six months uh, of age to those under nine years of age who had not yet received a previous influenza vaccine. Next slide, please. So there are some contraindications to influenza vaccination. And these are some of the groups who should not receive the vaccine. People who've had an anaphylactic reaction to any of the vaccine's components with the important exception of egg allergies. And we have a, a, a whole chapter on egg allergy in the Canadian Immunization Guide. People who have developed Guillain-Barre syndrome within six weeks of previous influenza vaccination, unless there was another cause that was found for the GBS or the Guillain-Barre syndrome. And here, really, it's a question of balancing the risks and benefits of a uh, possible reaction uh, that was uh, Guillain-Barre that was due to the vaccine compared with uh, the risk of getting Guillain-Barre from an influenza infection itself. Uh, so that's something to uh, be discussed with the patient and should be a joint decision making, in my opinion. And infants less months of age are not, uh, uh, are, do not respond. In other words, they, the influenza vaccine is not effective in kids under six months of age, and therefore we have that lower age limit set. 
Uh, important to note that these contraindications are specific to influenza vaccines. For other vaccines, please consult the CIG or the product monograph. Uh, another point is that we should uh, postpone influenza vaccination uh, uh, in people with a serious acute illness, but not for minor illnesses or moderate acute illnesses. Uh, again, more of the, on this in the Canadian Immunization Guide. Next slide, please. But what about live attenuated influenza vaccine? There are some particular contraindications or precautions to be taken with LAIV. So persons with immune compromising conditions should not re receive the vaccine, uh, either if it's due to underlying disease, therapy, or both, with the exception of children with stable HIV infection on highly active antiretroviral therapy and with adequate immune function. It's been shown that LAIV can, is safe in that population. Severe asthma is a contraindication defined as currently on oral or high dose inhaled glucocorticosteroids or having active wheezing. It's not contraindicated in patients with a history of stable asthma or recurrent wheeze. Medically attended wheezing in the last seven days prior to vaccination. Uh, children under 24 months of age due to an increased risk of wheezing following LAIV and children two to 17 years of age who are receiving aspirin, regular aspirin therapy due to the association with Rye syndrome uh, with influenza infection. Uh, influenza, per, sorry, persons who are pregnant, uh, it's a precaution or a contraindication because it is a live attenuated uh, vaccine and there is less data on uh, the safety of LAIV in pregnant persons than other products that are available uh, uh, for use during pregnancy. So the other products are preferred in pregnancy. Next slide, please. Uh, so when should you not receive an LAIV vaccine? Uh, well, antiviral agents will inhibit the replication that's important to the immune responses to the live attenuated vaccine. So LAIV should not be administered if uh, uh, recent uh, exposure to antiviral agents uh, against influenza within the last 48 hours. Uh, or if those uh, antiviral agents are, are, uh, should be administered within until two weeks after the receipt of the LAIV. Um, if you, uh, you're, you encounter a situation where a person did receive uh, antivirals within 48 hours from the prior to vaccination or two, up to two weeks post-vaccination, uh, you should consider revaccination at least 48 hours after the antivirals are stopped, uh, or you could simply give uh, inactivated influenza vaccine at any time. Next slide. So these are the NACSI recommended doses and routes of administration by age for influenza vaccine types that are currently available for use in Canada. And I think we've highlighted the number of doses that differs uh, potentially for young children who are receiving their first ever dose of influenza vaccine. There are some other minor modifications in terms of dosing. Uh, the pediatric adjuvanted vaccine is uh, half the volume, uh, whereas the uh, high dose influenza vaccine indicated for 65 and above is has a higher volume and four times the amount of antigen. And obviously the intranasal vaccine is administered in, uh, intranasally and not intramuscularly. Next slide, please. So, Key takeaways on NASI recommendations is that NASI has issued recommendations for healthcare providers on the appropriate selection of seasonal flu vaccines for the 23-24 season uh, that includes information on the flu and flu vaccines, the vaccine products recommended for specific groups and ages, contraindications, and dosage and routes of administration. And you can find all these recommendations in the statement itself or in the Canadian Immunization Guide. So Zin, we'll back to you. Thank you so much. Uh, so this brings us again to a, a polling question, which is again a multiple choice. So which of the following groups is considered a higher risk population? Is it A, people in direct contact with poultry infected with avian influenza during culling operations? B, adults and children with high risk chronic health conditions? C, all children six to 59 months of age? Or D, all of the above? Once again, if you're joining us on Zoom, just click the answer that you choose. And if you are, follow, if you are following us on YouTube, uh, then you can answer for yourself. We'll give you a minute to enter your response.
and we should be getting close to most people answering? The correct answer was D, all of the above. All of these groups are considered higher risk. Thank you. So we can switch to the next slide and we will start our final section. Uh, we will continue with Dr. Papenberg as our speaker. Over to you. Thanks, Claudine. Uh, switching gears now to antiviral agents. So not in the realm of prevention necessarily, but in the realm of treatment. Next slide, please. So most people with influenza will have mild illness and don't need medical care or any specific treatment for their influenza infection. But in the event someone does get the flu, antivirals are available that can be taken to decrease uh, the duration of symptoms and improve the risk of, or reduce the risk of severe outcomes related to influenza. So as healthcare providers, we may, may want to consider prescribing antivirals to reduce influenza morbidity and mortality. And I think especially for people who are at higher risk for complicated influenza infections, or for those that are sick enough to require hospitalization. So the use of antivirals will depend on primarily information you get from the patient's risk factor, uh, their relevant history, particularly the timing, how long the symptoms have been going on. And then you're gonna find out about the severity of symptoms and these things together will help you make decisions whether or not it's warranted to treat this influenza infection. Next slide, please. So these are the antivirals that are currently approved for use in Canada. Uh, uh, Tamiflu, uh, the generic name is also Tamivir, is the best known and most used. It's an oral capsule or liquid suspension for children. It's approved for use in persons one year of age and older, although AMI Canada does make recommendations on a case-by-case -case basis in children under one year of age. Zanamivir is inhaled uh, as a, through a discaler. Uh, it's a powder uh, that uh, is indicated for use in persons seven and above. The age limit is really related to the fact that it does require a certain amount of coordination to be able to inhale the product and make sure it ends up in the lower respiratory tract where you want to get it and not just on a, a young child's tongue. Um, it's not recommended for patients with... Uh, um, a reactive airway disease such as asthma or COPD because it can precipitate an exacerbation. Paramavir IV is, can be given intravenously. It's approved for use, but not marketed in Canada, the only intravenous uh, antiviral for in, uh, influenza, so only on special through special access. Uh, as well, Biloxivir Marboxyl is a first-in-class antiviral agent. The three previous were all neuraminidase inhibitors. This is a uh, cap endonuclease inhibitor, uh, um, uh, sorry, cap endonuclease dependent polymerase inhibitor. Uh, and what's interesting about Biloxivir Marboxyl is that a single dose is uh, shown to be effective uh, for the treatment of non-severe influenza and the outpatient setting, and it's approved for use in kids and persons 12 years of age and above. Unfortunately, it's not yet been marketed in Canada. And a quick note to say that the adamantanes, so amantadine, uh, are no longer recommended uh, for influenza treatment because all circulating strains in Canada are resistant to that class of medications. So you can find the AMI Canada guidance online on the treat for the treatment of influenza. Next slide, please. So the following recommendations are, are based on AMI Canada's uh, foundation document for the treatment of influenza. And first thing is that the sooner you initiate treatment, the more likely to, you are to have a greater benefit. So as fast as possible and ideally within uh, 48 hours, especially in the outpatient setting. But you can initiate and you should initiate, even if the interval between illness onset and the time you start the medication is greater than 40 hours, 48 hours, if the disease is severe enough to require hospitalization, there's evidence to show that even up to five days probably in hospitalized patients, it's beneficial, uh, five days since the illness onset. If the disease is progressive, severe, or complicated, so you're looking at an influenza pneumonia, regardless of the previous health status, so high risk or not individual, and if the individual is from a high risk group, uh, then uh, you might want to consider even if the duration of illness has been more than 48 hours and that patient is an outpatient. Next slide, please. So what's new in 2023? There was an update looking at some emerging issues, uh, and that is the document is expected to be available shortly and an advanced access uh, 
copy is available in uh, the advanced access section of JAMI. Guidance on the use of chemoprophylaxis with neuromediated inhibitors for post-exposure was published initially in 2013 and 2019. Uh, the recommendations uh, remain current, but some questions about that have been discussed in the new document. So uh, the updated guidance will provide you with an overview of last season, uh, what we can do to prevent influenza and very broad strokes, uh, influenza antiviral use to impact the healthcare system, especially uh, if we're concerned about potentially another quote unquote triple demic this winter with coast circulation of flu, COVID, and RSV. Uh, what's the potential role of multiplex respiratory testing in this context of uh, co-circulation of different respiratory viruses that can mimic the flu or uh, can look like influenza. Uh, also understanding that as there are certain, a lot of the indications for influenza treatment are also similar for COVID-19 in terms of some of the high-risk groups. So you might want to be able to distinguish flu from COVID-19 in order to uh, in initiate the appropriate treatment. And uh, also talking about some emerging issues that occurred this year related to highly pathogenic avian influenza viruses that had a bit of a spike in uh, detection worldwide and including in Canada. And we've now also included uh, updated the antiviral uh, algorithm, which includes uh, guidance for uh, highly pathogenic avian influenza. Next slide, please. And that's it for antivirals. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, healthcare providers may find uh, useful these recently updated vaccination guides as resources that they can provide patients or clients in preparation for vaccination, including receiving their influenza vaccine. So all of these are only available for download in English and in French on Canada.ca. So we can move to our next slide. Uh, I want to thank our presenters very much for uh, their presentation and their time. Um, and so before we move on to the question and answer period, I just wanna bring your attention to the QR code that is on the screen uh, right now. We invite you to please scan said QR code with your smartphone camera and to please complete our short evaluation for this webinar. Now, as we move to the Q&A period, I wanna remind you that it is taking place using the Q&A uh, tab that you can see at the bottom of your screen. You can um, uh, like other people's questions to push them up in priority. We will only be answering questions that are directly related to seasonal influenza uh, for this webinar. We'll try to answer many questions, but we do not have a lot of time left. Um, I'm going to give everyone a few seconds to look at the questions, and I will remind you uh, that a video of this presentation, as well as a copy of the presentation uh, of the slides, will be made available on the nccid.ca website uh, shortly after this presentation. We've also included some supplemental slides that, in the interest of time, we've not presented today, but that will be posted online for you to refer to. They include information on vaccines that are available in Canada and those that are not for the 2023-2024 season. The links to the NACI statement, the Canadian Immunization Guide, and the AMI Canada guidance on the use of antiviral drugs. There is an updated 2023 algorithm for antiviral treatment as well. We've also included links for free resources for frontline workers, flu awareness posters for printing, social media accounts to share, as well as information on the new vaccine injury support program. We encourage you to consult these uh, additional free resources. And now to move over, to move to the question and answer period. Okay, so the first question that I have, um, I'll invite our speakers back if they uh, don't mind. And the first question that I have uh, is for Dr. Harrison, that I'm hoping is here. Yes, of course. Yes, sorry. Yes. No, not at all. Um, so the first question I have is, are we expecting an earlier peak of flu again this year as per the Southern Hemisphere data? Uh, it, uh, so it's a good question. The people who are really expert in surveillance and epidemiology, I hear them often comment that uh, they're very reticent to predict and forecast with influenza because there can be variability. But yes, and if you looked at this season and uh, this year in the Southern Hemisphere, Australia and other countries, um, there, there was uh, more early introduction of influenza 
than um, <clears throat> say SARS-CoV-2 when you, uh, at that time in the reports, when you look at their percent positivity that they're reporting. But what I would say is that I think it, if you were to predict, you would predict we're going to return to pre-pandemic patterns. So while there may be some early influenza, I'm hopeful we won't see as brisk a peak this year. Um, and uh, I think the trend in the Southern Hemisphere is towards a more uh, traditional seasonal pattern. Thank you. Thank you for that. Certainly, um, there's I, no reason to think it won't be with us. And uh, I don't know, Colette Dean, sorry to just, uh, I see that our time is tight, but I wonder if uh, uh, Jesse wants to comment on uh, Dr. Ian Gemmel's question about influenza B. I just see he's highlighted that uh, that that it seemed to have disappeared in recent years. So my comment is that that one's a wild card still. So it's interesting times yet with influenza. Yeah, so uh, I mean, if uh, if that the question from Dr. Gemmel, if I see it, is that there was a marked decrease in B, uh, the Yamagata lineage, lineage specifically in the last couple of years. And, and actually, to my knowledge, uh, there still has not been a single B Yamagata detection worldwide uh, uh, since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and as as we know, and as Robin alluded to earlier, uh, with all the public health measures that were put into place to stop the transmission of COVID-19, uh, as well as potentially viral interference uh, from infections with COVID-19 itself, uh, there was a marked decrease in influenza circulation. Uh, and, and we just have not found any B. Yamagata yet. So like really, uh, uh, so one of the four uh, representative strains in every quadrivalent vaccine is Yamagata. So there is some talk about whether or not we may be moving in the seasons to come, not this season, but uh, perhaps the following season. If there still is no Yamagata around, it's possible that we will be moving back to trivalent vaccines with an h one and one an h 3 and 2 and a single B Victoria lineage representative uh, so three uh, in that trivalent vaccine, but who knows? It's I think it's still early to to, to say with any sort of uh, definitive answer that it's truly extinct. That Thank was really you. a virologist kind of geeky type of uh, uh, answer. I, I, I get it. Uh, I'm sorry, I may have been a bit long winded with that one. Not at all. Not at all. Dr. Harrison, did you want to add anything to this? No, thanks. It's really interesting. That's the point. There's we, we, everyone stays on their toes with influenza. Um, so I think we have time maybe for one more question. Uh, I have one for you, Dr. Harrison, uh, that was uh, in the Q&A tab. Is there evidence to support influenza vaccination in pregnant women in weeks 27 to 36 for best protective rates in infants similar to uh, Tdap? Oh, okay. Great question. Thanks for this. Um, so, um, first of all, just to say that the the publication that you'll see coming from uh, the National Advisory Committee really focused on um, pregnant women in any uh, stage of pregnancy, so any trimester. So that was the uh, sort of academic question for the literature search, and um, and so that was good because we can see the safety across all the trimesters. But you are right with pertussis. There's been some great research to really demonstrate that you can target a, a sweet spot, if you will. And the idea, of course, is not to delay too late, so that you have time for passive antibodies from the mother who's immunized to the baby. And so there's this target window. Some differences, though, I guess, with pertussis versus influenza is that with um, you know influenza, you won't have um, uh, vaccine available, for example, say July, August for the current season. Um, and, and you wouldn't want to delay vaccination beyond the, because influenza, unlike SARS-CoV-2, is seasonal, we wouldn't want to delay it in October um, because there's risk to the mother of the infection. So I think it, there are a few key differences there with the two vaccines. So the recommendations from NASI, which I would support, would be immunization at any stage of pregnancy is safe, effective, opportunity to convey benefit. And even if you're one of those latecomers, just delivering your baby, you have the benefit of preventing yourself from protection or from infection. So when you're breastfeeding and caring for your baby, you're going to reduce transmission that way too if you don't fall ill. So a little different, but safe in any trimester. And really, thanks for highlighting the pertussis. 
Thank you. Um, if I may, I think I'm going to try to squeeze in another question just because I want to take advantage of having such experts such as yourselves here. Um, so previous year, I, I'm going to aim this one at Dr. Pappenberg, but of course it's open to both of you. Previous years, um, in previous years, sorry, it was discussed that receiving seasonal influenza vaccines in one or more previous seasons might reduce vaccine effectiveness against the circulating strain. What is your opinion on this subject? Yeah, so the concept of how repeated seasonal influenza vaccination might affect uh, an individual's ability to respond to a subsequent season's influenza vaccine is something that's been examined, I think, in the last decade more closely. And the literature is, um, is not necessarily consistent in what it finds. Uh, but I can say that NASI did an exhaustive systematic review of the literature and recently published a supplemental statement on this. I believe it was last year um, examining the totality of the evidence. And I think the bottom line is that one thing the literature says that is quite clear is that getting the vaccine is always more protection than not getting the vaccine, regardless of how many doses, how many years of seasonal influenza vaccine you've had in the past. And that any evidence to suggest that repeated vaccination might hamper the effectiveness of the vaccine is is rather limited and seems to be have been observed in spe very specific seasons. So it's not something that we can say is systematic. And the and, and based on that, uh, there's no reason for for people to be, or, or for NASI to recommend anything other than seasonal influenza vaccine uh, every year for uh, people who are in whom it's indicated. I hope I, I hope I answered that uh, uh, satisfactorily. You really did. Thank you. Um, so I want to thank you again, uh, Drs. Harrison and Pappenberg, or speakers who took time to present for us today and to stay over time to answer more questions. Um, I want to remind you that a copy of the presentation deck and the recording will be posted on the NCCID website at nccid.ca. A link will be sent to all those who attended today's webinar when the video is ready for viewing. Uh, reminder to please complete the evaluation survey. We really appreciate your feedback uh, as these surveys are important for future planning. Finally, we'd like to thank all of you who attended today. Thank you.